speaker. Uh, who has spoken at various top universities on quantum computing. Today, he'll be talking about uh, quantum entanglement and explaining it in a simple manner using series of games, non-local games. So, it'll be a great talk to, for you to understand about the physics behind Nobel Prize and also to learn something. Over to you, Dinesh. Okay, thanks, Sri. Yeah. So uh, essentially, yeah, so the title for today's talk is Quantum Advantage to Non-Local Games. Uh, so actually, the way I'll be proceeding is that I'll motivate this through one example. So I'm not assuming any background on quantum computing. So we'll just start with one game and maybe I'll try to make it interactive. Uh, so if we can find a couple of players, then maybe we can have the players play the game and then I'll you know move on to what is quantum computing and how it helps to win that particular game. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so this year in 2022, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics has gone for uh, testing of Bell inequalities, right? So basically this is the this is one by the physicists Alan Aspects, John Clauser and Anton Zillinger. So all these three were involved in experimentally demonstrating notions of Bell inequalities and also in teleportation and all. So the basics of a quantum information were established uh, uh, and, uh, and basically there, it was also experimentally demonstrated, right? So as you would be known, so Nobel Prize is typically given for something which has been practically demonstrated and they had actually uh, done these things. Although these inequalities were given earlier, uh, the experimental demonstration came from uh, these three scientists. Okay, uh, but what exactly is the work, right? And what exactly is the Bell inequality which has been established? So all those things, you know, some of you would be knowing, some of you may not be, right? So in this talk, we are going to look at that particular aspect. Uh, so to start with, let me just now get onto the topic directly. Okay, so even before defining anything quantum, before even defining, you know, what is a qubit measurement? So I'm not going to that right now. Let's just play this particular game, right? Because in order to understand the game, you don't need to know anything about quantum computing. So the game is as follows that, you know, there are two players. So you have Alice and Bob. So you see Alice here and Bob here. And then there is a referee. So star is the referee over here. And the thing is that each of these two players, Alice and Bob, they receive an input bit X and Y respectively. And it's the referee who is providing them input bits. So first thing is that Alice and Bob, even before the game begins, they can discuss their strategy amongst them. However, once the game starts, they are separated apart, you know, and they could be separated in a light years apart or whatever distance. Uh, so that it's practically impossible for them to communicate during the game. So suppose if the game runs for say two minutes, then during those two minutes, that communication should be impossible. So if they're separated, you know, say more than two light minutes apart, then they won't be able to communicate during that period of time. And the referee, the star, okay, so he gives them a bit each, X and Y. Okay, so the referee has communicated these bits to them or we know that, okay, let's say that the referee has decided, has basically delegated this task to two other sort of referees who have gone to these two players and they communicate the bits X and Y at the same time. So these bits X and Y are randomly distributed with, uh, between zero and one with probability half each. Okay, so with probability half each of these bits is zero. Uh, with pro so, so each of these bits is independently zero or one with probability half. Okay, uh, so it could happen, you know, with one fourth probability that both inputs are zero, or it could, you know, x is zero, y is one, or y is zero, x is one, and y is one, or x is also one. So, so each of the four outcomes are possible with probability half, uh, with probability one fourth each. Okay, so so we have two independent bits, two independent uniform bits x and y, which are given to each of these two players, and now. Based on the input X and Y, 
each player needs to respond with an output bit A or B. So uh, Alice responds with an output bit A and Bob responds with an output bit B. So note that during the game, Alice and Bob cannot communicate with each other. Okay, so they only have the idea of their own inputs. So Alice only knows X and Bob only knows Y. So uh, they don't have idea of each of the other bits. So the winning condition over here is that, okay, so, so this is their outcomes are A and B, but okay, so what's their goal, right? How, how do they win the game? So they win the game if the and of the inputs, right? If X and Y equals A, X or B, right? So I think all of you know, right? Basic logical operators. So X and Y is one if like both X and Y are one. So if X is also one and Y is also one, then X, Y is going to be one. In this case, the outputs must be unequal, right? Because A, X or B uh, tests whether A and B are unequal or not, right? So basically if both the inputs are one, then the winning condition is that the outputs must be unequal. However, if even if one of the input bits is zero, say X is zero or Y is zero, in which case X and Y, which I'm also writing as X, Y is going to be zero. Then in that case, the winning condition is that A and B must be equal, right? Because only then I can ensure that A, X or B. Um, so any questions until now, like I, although I'll be giving an example, but if you still like, if anyone wants to, you know, uh, raise hand and ask, you can, right. Or if you want me to repeat, that's also fine. Sir, from third point, if you can please repeat. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So you have gotten the, so, so. This is a game in which you receive each player receives a bit as the input and they need to produce a bit as output. Okay. And the input bits are uniformly distributed. And are, uh, so these are basically independent and uniformly distributed between zero and one. However, the output bits A and B, they, they are sort of decided by the players. Okay. So based on the input X, Alice needs to produce an output bit B. Based on the input Y, Bob needs to produce an output. So, so Alice needs to produce an output bit A. And based on the input Y, Bob needs to produce an output bit B. Okay. Now the thing is that how, okay. So, so once they give these inputs, uh, once they give produce these outputs A and B, how do we check whether they have won the game or lost the game, right? So for that, we are defining a winning condition that if this condition on the outputs and inputs is satisfied, we say that Alice and Bob have won the game. If it is not satisfied, then we say that they have lost the game. So when is it that they win the game? The winning condition is that the and of the inputs equals XOR of the outputs. Okay. So what does that mean? So and of the inputs, which is one, if both are one. So if both are one, then the XOR, the outputs must be unequal so that their XOR is one. However, if at least one of them is zero, then the XOR must also be zero. Right. So this is the winning condition and XOR between two bits is zero if both they are equal, right? So, so if you have zero XOR zero or one XOR zero, one XOR one, then it's zero. But if you have zero XOR one or one XOR zero, then it's one. So, so basically if you are just testing inequality, then that's equivalent to checking XOR. So what we want is that bits should be unequal if both inputs are one and output bits should be equal if at least one of the inputs is zero. Uh, I, I'll explain it again through an example. Uh, so, so, so let's, uh, see an example. Okay. So basically if X is zero and Y is zero. Okay. So basically in this case, X and Y is also going to be zero. In this case, what I want is that the output should satisfy that A, X or B is zero. Then only we say that the players have won the game. However, if one of the inputs is zero, right? Suppose if zero, one or one, zero, then again, and is going to be zero. Again, we want that the XOR must be zero for them to win the game. But if both the inputs are one, right? In which case the and is also one, then we want that A, X or B must be one. So the bits must be unequal. Output bits must be unequal for them to win the game. So I see, uh, okay. So, okay. See, I just saw chat now. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I think it's fine. Na? Screen and all. Yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. So basically this table describes the conditions on A and B based on different, you know, instances of X and Y. What are the conditions on A, A X or B for them to win the game? Okay. So 
now uh, is it fine to all like or you want me to repeat the game again so i was thinking maybe we can have a demonstration so if two players could volunteer but, but before that i wanted to just check that you know if uh, it's fine until now the description of the game hi dheeraj uh, hi hi so i i just had a small verification so the a and b which are outputted by the player should be local right the a will depend locally on the bit 6 x and y will depend locally on the bit b right yeah. so a depends on x and b depends on y yeah so there are no mutually mutually intercorrelations right between the bit 6 and y right yeah so the thing is that you know they can discuss the strategy beforehand so in that sense they can create a sort of a correlation and in case of quantum we'll see that you know using entanglement they have access to some sort of a different form of correlation also but yeah so you, since you have discussed the strategy so we can't say that a and b are independent okay so you can make them sort of dependent in the sense that they have discussed the strategy, but A cannot depend on Y and B cannot depend on X, right? So A can only depend on X and B can only depend on Y. So they, they, the, they can't see the other person's input, right? But what you could have ensured is that, okay, they let's they decide a strategy so that, you know, that uh, initially they have decided their output. So in that sense, you can create correlations. But it'll it'll just be those correlations will be of the form of something they have already pre-decided before the game. So okay. that's the only form of correlation. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Got During it. the game, they can't communicate. Yeah. Neither can they see each other. Ah, yeah. got it. Got it. that is a restriction, right? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this local game, when we see, when we call it a non-local game, right? So. We'll actually see that uh, in quantum, the the uh, like what we'll just see is that uh, maybe towards the end of the talk we'll reach that point. So in quantum, the thing is that there is no local description of a quantum state, and that would give rise to entanglement. So over there, right now in classically, uh, the constraints have ensured that you know they, that uh, the they cannot depend on the input you know, uh, others input, but here we'll see that how, how non-locality in quantum will help us uh, achieve a uh, greater winning probability. Uh, so uh, before that, uh, I like before proceeding further, let's just play this game between two players. So any volunteers, like if you want to volunteer, you can raise your hand. So I don't see any. So is there a raise hand option in Zoom, Sri? Uh, yeah, it's actually the reaction. Go to reaction. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so if anyone wants to volunteer, yeah. So either you can unmute hands. Let me know. Uh, sir, I would like to volunteer. Supreet. Okay. Supreet and Deepti. Okay. 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 Okay, thanks, Supreet and Nidhi. Uh, yeah, so, uh, okay, so maybe I'll give you a couple of minutes and you can discuss your winning strategy uh, over chat. So you can have a private discussion or public discussion, whatever you prefer, or uh, like whatever way you want to communicate. So you can take a couple of minutes and uh, discuss the strategy which you are going to follow. So Deepti, I'm making you Alice and Supreet, I'll make you Bob. Okay. Okay. There is a way to create a breakout room. Uh, it, uh, I don't need that actually, you know, uh, Deepti and uh, Supreet, Supreet can chat privately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, you, if you like go to the list of participants, you can select that participant and uh, start a private chat with the person. So, so you can discuss the like whatever strategy you, you have and then we'll play the game and then you can uh, you know tell us what was your winning strategy so others also in the meanwhile if you have all understood the game so maybe just think about it okay suppose if you were one of the players then uh, how would you decide that strategy okay
uh, sir, I had a doubt actually. So we can, uh, uh, so our strategy doesn't have to be this strategy, right? We can have any strategy uh, under the condition that, uh, let's say I have to choose, uh, I mean, I have to choose B and Deepthi has to choose A and her A only depends on her X and and my B basically depends on my Y, right? And the X and Y have been distributed by the star, correct? Right. This is how it should go. Okay, okay. Right. Right. So basically just discuss amongst yourself that, okay, if this is the X, I'll say this A. And if this is the Y, I'll say this particular B. So that you uh, discussed amongst yourself. So. Okay, uh, uh, are you done or you need some time? We're almost done. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, let me know. It's fine if you want to take a minute. Uh, Uh, okay, uh, done. Uh, Supreet and Deepthi. Yes, I have uh, talked to Deepthi about. I'm just waiting uh, uh, from uh, waiting to hear from her. Actually. Uh, okay. Okay. So Deepthi, you are fine. Uh, Deepthi, did you see the chat? Uh, I have uh, shared the strategy with you. Yeah, uh, like I have seen it. Okay. Uh... Yeah. So let's start then. Uh, sh should we? Uh, okay. So, so I'll uh, say, okay. Okay, I'll send a private message to Supreet and Deepthi. So maybe also if you have discussed and understood the strategy. So now let's start playing the game. Okay, uh, but it's fine, right? So there is no nothing you are going to win or lose because there is no prize. <laughs> I don't know if Q Krishi has some goodies or something, but... Uh, We'll plan for that next week. Okay, <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Like I, okay. So basically, as you don't have to worry about it. Okay, even if you lose, you will not uh, suffer much. Okay, so <laughs> it, it's just a fun game. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so let's uh, play the uh, game. Diti, you understood the strategy, right? Uh, so what what X leads to what A, and what Y leads to what B.
okay yeah so i think uh, we'll have to start the game so maybe uh now let's say that you can't communicate more and i i'll only give you inputs based on which you'll have to respond with an output okay so i'm assuming that you're honest players so there, there won't be any communication further okay so let's start uh, So, so Preet and Niti, yeah, so I have sent you a bit each. Okay, so now you need to respond to me. And uh, I assume that you're honest player, so you won't be communicating now. Like you won't be communicating amongst yourself, so you can just communicate with me. Yes, I have received my bit. Okay, and uh, what's uh, your output? Just direct message me for now. Uh, Diti, I think you're not supposed to reveal that to me. You're uh, uh, yeah. messaging me. You're not supposed to reveal that, uh, you know, uh, your A to me, actually. This time you revealed. <laughs> okay. And so with this strategy, I know. Uh, okay. Don't reveal it, Diti. What you do is uh, uh, once you get your uh, Y, okay, uh, convert it to B based on a strategy and keep it with yourself. Okay, I think the results uh, you have to be disclosing to afterwards. Uh, yeah, just have to send it to me only. Okay, so you don't have to okay. communicate. Okay, it. Yeah. I will send it to you later. Yeah, so you have to just respond over the chat only. So let, let's do it again. Okay. Yeah. So this is the last time if it okay. doesn't work out, then I'll just move with the rest of the No, no, no. It, it should work out. It should work out. Let's go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sure, sure, sure. So I'm sending a bit to Supreet and a bit to Titi. Okay, so uh, ignore your earlier bits. The new bits are the ones which I have sent and uh, just respond to me with the bit as the output. Uh, so please, yeah, your response, Deepthi, your response. So, okay, okay, fine. So here, essentially, I gave uh, the input. Uh, mm, uh, so I gave the input uh, zero to Supreet and one to Deepthi, and Supreet responded with a zero, and Deepthi responded with a one. Okay, so basically, we were in the case that uh, here, basically, Alice. X received a zero and Bob received, uh, sorry, X received a one and Bob received a zero, which was this particular case. And uh, here the outputs are also one and zero, which means that their XOR is going to be one, right? Not zero. So in this sense, uh, the, the, they have lost the game, but essentially, uh, so the idea is that, uh, so somebody had correctly pointed Akshit that uh, the best strategy should guarantee a probability of success of three fourth. So before coming to Akshat, so Supreet, uh, could you tell like what was your strategy, like what you had in your mind? Uh, my strategy uh, was that, you know, uh, when I receive X equal to, uh, let's say, uh, whatever bit I receive, uh, my B will be the same as the bit I received. Output is the same as input. Okay. Yes. What's yes. the winning probability in that case? Mm, okay. Winning probability in that case... Uh, so X and Y are, you know, half each with probability. Uh, so they are zero or one with probability half each and they are independent. So basically each of these four combinations occurs with probability one fourth. Okay. So basically mm -hmm. in the first case, when X is zero and Y is zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your A and B are both zero. XOR is also zero. So essentially in this case, you will win the game. Yes. However, in this case, zero and one, you will lose the game, right? Win because the game. because yes, the outputs are going to be zero and one. So XOR is also going to be uh one which is not zero 
whereas in the third case again it's similar so you'll lose the game in the fourth case you'll win the game okay so you win the game with probability half in in your okay. strategy Okay. okay but okay. akshit had said that he can he knows a strategy wherein you can win with probability 3 4 so akshit could you uh, unmute so would you like to discuss uh, yeah sure. yeah sure so my strategy was that if i uh, if i'm alice then, then i'll just input whatever i got and if i'm bob i'll input what the opposite of what i got so in that case uh, let's say i got 0 0 as inputs so i will output 0 and 1 so the zor would have been one in that case and uh, only in one case i think i would have lost i guess when both are one i think um, okay. yeah so you're saying was, if you are uh, alice both are zero output, so so if you are alice you output uh, what you get so basically if x yes. is equal to zero if it is zero it's zero one is one and one is one and bob uh, responds with the opposite opposite yes yes by so zero then b is one so this case you will lose Yes. Uh, if y is one, then b is zero. So this case you will win. Here, this is one and one, so you will win. And here, this is one and this is zero, so you will win. Okay. So in the zero zero case, you are going to lose. Yes. Okay. Okay. If I exchange Alice and Bob, then it will be one one where it will be lost. But yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. 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 I see. I see. I see. Right, right, right. So actually, a very other simple strategy, you know, is that every time you just output a zero, forget about the input. Every time you output a zero, then a x or b is going to be always zero, and you will win three out of four times. So that's the simplest strategy, right? Yeah, that's that's true. That's easy. You know. So uh, basically, every time you output a zero, and you will win three out of four times. right and uh, this is the simplest strategy and it turns out that it's the best one so you have completely ignored the input but you win with probability 3 4 and that is in fact the best you can do classically okay uh, and you know why is it the best because in every other scenario basically the thing is that you you cannot define a as a function of x and b as a function of y wherein you win with all four conditions okay and uh, okay so i'm not going to prove that but it's a very simple proof and i can point you to the references for that uh, but the thing is that even if you share randomness right so even if they had access to you know so even if there is some sort of a random shared string they decided at the beginning right even then they won't be able to win the game right so basically in every instance of the game you discuss a new random string and then based on that you create your outputs uh, x uh, a and b basically every every time the game start before the game starts you meet again and again you use some shared randomness but even then you won't be able to win the game with probability more than 3/4 so the question is that you know can we do better and the answer is that yes so quantum information uh, over there there is something paradoxical which allows us to win with probability more than 3/4 and so that that um so in order to get that let's start with a bit of quantum computing um uh, so basically since uh, all of you are engineering uh, students huh, i sorry. have a doubt yes sorry for the interruption dheeraj uh, so in this case the strategy was uh, a x or b suppose it was i mean finally to calculate we had to use the a x or b suppose had we used a different uh, instead of ax or b let's say some so this is uh, the okay this is not the strategy right ax or b uh, is like the game condition so the, so ha uh, yeah such that the game is defined in this manner that this is the this is the scenario when you win the particular game okay so my question is that irrespective of what the game condition is you know the best is, that's that is possible is 3 three, 3/4 three that's all uh, that That's no, no, the amount. No, no, no. This is uh, this three-fourth probability is for the particular way we have defined the game, right? So yes, but the maximum is that, or we could yeah, go yeah, to. Yeah, it's the maximum, but you can't change a x or b condition, right? Because you can't change the rules of the game, right? So the rules yeah, of the game are that x should be a x or b. This is the particular rule of the game. Under this game, the best winning strategy is uh, uh, gives a probability. You know, opposite. Alice and Bob choosing different ways for the strategy. No, actually, you don't need that. You just want every time you just output a zero, right? You'll win with three. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, I understood. Yeah. So you don't need to do anything based on the input in order to get the best uh, success probability. Okay. Okay. Right. 
so now let's see how like quantum essentially allows us to win the game so before that before moving to quantum let's see you know what classical physics was so in classical physics you know the world is completely deterministic and you have a complete information about the world right so you at high school you have studied about newtonian mechanics in newtonian mechanics if you know the position of every particle and the initial velocity of every particle you can determine the future trajectory right uh, you might have to you know do some sort of uh, you'll have to write a bunch of equations based on the newton's laws and then solving that laws will allow you in the end to produce a trajectory of every particle right so but of course like the number of particles in the universe is too huge so you can't you know just model out everything but conceptually it is possible to get a complete information about this universe and this universe is also deterministic so if i know the position of every particle right now i know everything about the universe in future right so uh, this is how the classical world looked like okay it seemed like the world is this way uh, but at the start of quantum mechanics so basically at the early 20th century or towards the end of 19th century physicists realized that you know there were some inconsistencies with the way the classical physics worked right so some there were some deviations in spectrum there were some deviations in uh, those black body radiations and during that time people realized that well there in order to you know uh, talk about uh, subatomic world uh we'll have to essentially move to a slightly different way of uh understanding physics and that's how this quantum mechanics took birth now in summary the thing is that quantum mechanics is probabilistic which means that uh, you know that even if you have so so whatever is the best information about the state you can get right now that won't allow you to you know predict with certainty the future outcomes so it's essentially probabilistic moreover the uh, uh, the state right so the notion of an observable which we associate okay this is the position this is the velocity okay so unless and until you make a measurement you don't have a precise value of any quantity at all what you have is a notion of a state but then state vector is also not always known and in order to know that you will have to make something called a measurement which we will just describe now and in which case you essentially even lose the state right and also there are some incompatible state variables right for example position and velocity so you can't uh, measure them or know them both simultaneously uh so this was a very quick and uh, like a sort of a very high level overview of uh, uh what quantum mechanics is but we won't need too much of it we'll just need some basic axioms which we'll see now and uh, we will then try to understand how to you know win that game with a better success probability assuming these axioms uh so these axioms i am describing in the computing framework only and not the physics framework because in fact this is easier and this is also directly relevant to us in today's talk uh so essentially when we try to look at classical computing right so classical computing uh, involves interpreting classical bits which are 0 and 1 and logic gates right so logic gates could be for example these and or xor and this is how uh, you know all the circuitry in 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 your uh, any computing device is is composed of right so essentially you have a set of logic gates and then based on the logic gates you make some sort of arrangements and then essentially you will be able to describe any sort of a classical circuit and this universal computer allows you to you know, program our program or software in such a way that with that particular circuit we can run any competition yeah so any question uh so someone wanted to ask something okay let, let me continue so essentially uh, uh like a classical bit consists of two values 0 and 1 and then you have some sort of gates you also have a universal gate which is nand and you can compose your entire classical computation in form of these bits and logical gates uh now why do we need quantum computing okay well the thing is that the classical computers cannot simulate this quantum mechanics efficiently and in order to do that you know we will actually need an exponential number of resources in terms of the number of particles which we are trying to simulate and
and so this basically uh, so richard feynman then thought that maybe what if you know the computers themselves directly simulate quantum computing quantum mechanics and that gave birth to the rise of quantum computing so let's see what it is exactly right so quantum computing here the basic abstraction instead of a bit it moves to the idea of a qubit and a qubit can take a value so like we had a classical bit taking a value either 0 or 1 here we talk about uh, instead of you know two possible values we will have an entire vector space of values so one of the possible base states in that vector space will be denoted by cat 0 which is represented by the classical bit 0 so this cat symbol just represents a vector okay so don't worry too much about this angle brackets just think of it as a vector okay so there is a set of a vector which i'm calling 0 cat 0 and then there is an orthogonal vector which i'm calling cat 1 but uh, in general i can even talk about their superposition which is alpha cat 0 plus beta cat 1 so alpha and beta have to be uh, normalized so basically mod alpha square plus mod beta square must be 1 okay so let, let me let me actually show you a geometric way uh, so basically just consider your 2d 2d space okay and uh, here one of the axis is cat 0 one of the axis is cat 1 so if your vector lies along cat 0 completely it's the classical bit 0 if it lies along uh, the axis cat 1 it is the classical bit 1 but what if it lies somewhere in between so here we just say that this is a vector alpha cat 0 plus beta cat 1 right so you can express any other vector in terms of these two orthogonal basis vectors and i can even give a matrix representation of this right so i can represent them by 2d column vectors so if i write my cat 0 as 1 comma 0 and cat 1 as 0 1 then my cat psi right a general arbitrary vector alpha 0 plus beta 1 is just going to be the column vector alpha beta these are the components and this is how they look geometrically so however it should be that psi is always a unit vector in which case the squared mod of alpha and beta their sum must be one and note that these alpha and beta are not real numbers these are complex numbers so in this picture for example you will need a real and an imaginary component for alpha and a real and an imaginary component for beta also so actually uh, overall you will need four components but just for simplification i am right now i am describing it on this 2d plane so you will actually need a block sphere to describe the state fully but right now we are not going there um uh, but yeah any questions until now yeah so somebody was asking about us uh, heisenberg sort of a inter okay so yeah photo i could have added but yeah the ideas and all i am not going into too much detail on heisenberg yeah okay uh, if there are no questions i'll proceed how to compute probability of complex numbers so essentially the thing is that okay we will come to probabilistic interpretation and i'll discuss measurement but right now it's just a uh, complex vector a 2d complex vector is how i represent the qubit and the so basically it's a 2d vector where both components are complex numbers alpha and beta okay so that's how it is so now somebody was asking about the pro, uh, like the probability part so essentially what does this state alpha cat 0 plus beta cat 1 mean okay the thing is that the interpretation of the state only comes up when you make a measurement so once i make a measurement i'm going to get zero with probability mod alpha square and one with probability mod beta square right so essentially alpha and beta are themselves not the probabilities but it's their squared amplitude squared magnitudes which form the probability so essentially we are not interpreting complex numbers in probability we are essentially taking the squared magnitude right so squared magnitudes are always going to be real and positive and they also sum up to be one so since they sum up to one we can actually give a probabilistic interpretation this is a valid interpretation but this is provided i make a measurement right before making the measurement it's just a state it's an uncollapsed state before i make the measurement okay uh 
So not just can you make a measurement in this zero one basis, what I could have considered was that let me consider now some rotated basis also. So in linear algebra, you would have studied that when you define a basis, you need not, you know, just take the standard basis. You can even consider a rotated basis also. So suppose if I have some rotated basis, cat V and cat V per, and now what I can do is that I can take the projections onto each of these, and then that will give me the probability of measuring to cat V or cat V perpendicular. Right. Uh, so this is how, you know, the measurement looks like, uh, any questions at this point? Arthik, you want to ask something? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, so this was the case for a single qubit. Okay. But what if I have more qubits? So suppose if I have two qubits, then basically I would be in, in you know, some linear combination of now four basis vectors. So cat 0, 0, cat 0, 1, cat 1, 0, and cat 1, 1. Similarly, if I have n qubits, then basically I'll be describing them with a two to the power n dimensional vector, and it's basically a superposition of these two to the power n dimensional vector. Now the thing is that let's take an example of a state. So basically, in two, like for two qubits, I can have a state alpha zero zero cat zero zero plus alpha zero one cat zero one plus alpha one zero cat one zero plus alpha one one cat one one, right? Now, one example for this thing could be the EPR pair, which is like one by root two cat zero plus one by root two cat one one. Now, in this case, like the thing is that earlier, as I was describing, I get either zero or one. Here now, when I make a measurement, I'll get two bits, zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. And the respective probabilities are going to be mod alpha zero, zero square, mod alpha zero, one square, mod alpha one, zero square, and mod alpha one, one square. So for example, if I have this particular EPR pair, I can measure to 0, 0 with probability 1 by root 2 squared, which is half, or I can measure to 1, 1 with probability again 1 by root 2 squared, which is half. So essentially the thing is that I'm either going to get both 0 or both 1 with probability half. Right. So here essentially the outputs are correlated. And this happens, you know, even if I take the qubits light years apart, okay, I take them at a very large distance. So that you know, they, they, uh, it, it may look that okay, there is no possible communication which is happening. However, when I make the independent measurements on them, right? So the measurements are based on the qubit separately, and still the outcomes are going to be correlated. And like this is the most unintuitive part of quantum mechanics. And here, essentially, this idea is called as entanglement, right? And note that in classical case, also we can have you know correlated correlated distributions, but uh, over there, the, the, it's, it's a correlation of a very different sort of a kind right now. And the difference over here is such that, you know, I could have even measured in, in different sort of bases, right? So I, I haven't defined other possible states, but there are some sort of superposed uh, states also like cat plus and cat minus on single qubits. And even if I measure them in those bases, I'm going to get the correlated outcomes. And it's, it's quite strange in the sense that, you know, this allows us to achieve certain things which which are never possible with any classical sort of correlations uh so one corollary one thing is that you know if you shared an entanglement then the quantum players can win the game which i described earlier with the probability of more than 0.85 right so earlier i said that classically winning with probability 3 4 more than 3 fourth was not possible but now i can even win with probability almost 0.85 and this has been what is experimentally verified through Bell tests and which, which basically uh, was the uh, thing for which they got for, for which the three, the Allen aspects, Zillinger and uh, yeah, so basically the three physicists had got the Nobel prize. And in the main idea over there is that it essentially shows that quantum mechanics cannot be modeled by local hidden variables. Uh, so Einstein, for example, for, uh, like after which this particular state has been named, it stands for EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. So they had written a paper, which basically claimed in 1935, 
and their idea was that you know quantum mechanics is an incomplete theory the reason why they believed that it was incomplete was because they felt that okay if if you know if both local and locality and realism is true then basically quantum mechanics cannot stand right so it, either it has to give up on locality or it has to give up on realism and uh, they said that well it is not possible so basically uh, this uh, this particular theory is incomplete that's what they claimed uh, these three physicists einstein podolsky and rosen and uh, however uh, mm, uh, it was first theoretically proven that well uh, so basically bell had designed this test a theoretical test which would allow us to uh, like test that whether you know whether a local hidden variable sort of a model uh can be distinguished from a quantum entanglement based model and uh, he designed this particular instance of this scheme and uh that was you know considered a uh, sort of uh, so, so basically that was considered uh, a test for quantumness and it was later experimentally proven that well in, in in using using a particular quantum strategy which involved players sharing an epr pair and then making you know sort of measurements based on their inputs would allow them to win the game with uh, sufficiently high probability which is not possible classically at all uh now there, the question, there are two questions yeah 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 so one question i see is that how is the calculation done for resulting 0.85 well yeah so that analysis will not be possible right now in the interest of time and also since uh, um, yeah so basically for that i'll need to develop more background in order to uh, calculate that specific probability uh however i can get, try to give you some intuition let me try to do that and the other question is that what are local hidden variables so local hidden variables are essentially sort of basically each each of these qubits is essentially not a specific superposed state but okay so there is a sort of a hidden variable either it's zero or one and uh, uh, that specific hidden variable is revealed when you make a measurement so that what that was what einstein used to think okay that okay, if 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 there is a way that you know what if he could formulate quantum mechanics in in such a way that uh there is a sort of a variable and which is unknown and the measurement just ends up revealing that specific variable so his question was that you know whether it's uh, sort of possible to design quantum mechanics in that way and and basically the idea was that he didn't like this notion of an inherent sort of a state and with the specific probabilistic outcomes so he used to in fact say that you know god does not play dice so that's for one of his famous quotations is uh, but actually this particular game this particular experimental test proof that you know that okay so the universe or whatever you want to call it it, it actually does play dice in some sense right so <laughs> probability is inherent in the way uh, the universe works okay so that's uh one take away point um and yeah so basically local hidden variables was a specific like sort of uh, theory which einstein wanted to create but he could not so basically his idea was that whenever you talk about a quantum state there is a sort of a hidden variable already associated with that and uh, whenever you make a measurement you essentially reveal that particular outcome with some probability so there are uh, like uh, mm, if you want to go further into this and like this analysis and all i would actually like to point you to this particular youtube course which i also have uh, so i'll be sharing these slides so you'll be able to get the link to that and uh, yeah so now coming to some intuition of the analysis i can take some time to do that uh, but before that if there is any other question i can take up that i, I can try to give some sort of intuition for the particular game so yeah so i'll need to join from my ipad right so now, right now i have to join from my laptop so before that if you have any other questions you can ask as well uh hi dheeraj uh huh so uh, you have put a lower bound on the winning probability so can it approach 1 no 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 uh there is an upper like so basically this is tight so actually it's cos square pi by 8 is the exact value uh i just said that it's greater than equal to 0.85 to give an approximation uh the exact value is cos square pi by 8 so it's 0.851 or something like that okay 
Yeah. It's actually half plus one over two root two. So it's almost point eight five. So and it's actually the best you can do even in quantum. You can't do better than that. So I think uh, your inequality is making it can mean with probability greater than Sorry, you're not audible. Because um, he asked that because uh, in shit can mean with probability greater than uh, So so what's the question? Uh, That's why he thought like can it go can it goes to one. No, so no, it's upper bound is right? Yeah, it's uh, the exact value is cos square pi by eight. I just said greater than equal to because I I, I didn't want to write the full full decimal form. Uh, it's so cos square pi by eight is the exact value. Upper bound, upper bound. Cos square pi by eight. That's oh, the exact okay. value. Okay. That's the best you can do. You can't do better than cos square pi by eight. You and, and it's um, cos square pi by eight is also achievable. I just wrote greater than equal to just to you know because I wanted to give it in some uh, decimal form. I didn't want to write it in cosine form. So. I gave you the particular value and I just said greater than or equal to 0.85. The, the exact value is cos square pi by 8 and that is the best value also. Yeah, so somebody is asking about Q trait. So yeah, we can't uh, discuss that uh, right now, but essentially the thing is that here the states are cat 0 and cat 1. In Q trits, you can have like three level systems, cat 0, cat 1, cat 2. So there are some people who work on uh, these Q trits. But uh, yeah, so typically the most of the practical devices which we are seeing today are based on qubits. Yeah, but there are works where people are trying to, you know, design Q trits or analyze algorithms with Q trits. But uh, yeah, the, the current uh, systems which we have, for example, in IBM, we have this uh, IBM Q hardware and we have Qiskit to access that. So that is all based on qubits and most of the other frameworks are also based on that. So the standard thing is qubits. Yeah. And even in classical thing, you always talk about bits, right? So the reason is that bits are reliable. If you have two level systems, the, the larger the number of states you create, uh, the more are the chances of error. So that's why people work with this. What are quantum mechanical models consistent with Bell test? Yeah, the standard quantum mechanics, Bell test Schrodinger's quantum mechanics, right? So, so that's uh, consistent with Bell tests. Uh, so Einstein's hidden variable theory was not quantum mechanics, right? So he was trying to circumvent quantum mechanics through that hidden variable theory. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so actually it will take some time for me to, you know, start that iPad and all because I uh, don't have a, so I need to join that Zoom and all from there. So maybe it will take a time. So I'll uh, skip that, but maybe I can just try, you know, drawing over this particular, uh, PowerPoint only because it won't be that good, but I'll try to give some intuition. Uh, so essentially the thing is that the way they win the particular game is that, uh, so the two players, essentially they share an EPR pair. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so, so the idea is that you have, uh, these, this EPR pair, which is shared by Alice and Bob. And each of them, you know, they make a sort of a measurement in different basis sets, depending on the inputs. So if Alice's, you know, input is zero. Okay. So then basically she makes a measurement in the standard basis. Okay. But if Alice's input, so this is when uh, your X is zero. But if X is one, she makes a measurement in the rotated basis. Uh, are you sharing screen? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I stopped sharing na, earlier, huh? Okay, so basically if Alice's input X is zero, she makes a measurement in the standard basis. And if X is one, she makes a measurement in this 
forty five degree rotated basis. Okay, and based on the outcome of the measurement, she says a zero or a one. Similarly for Bob, uh, if the input is zero, he makes a measurement in the basis which is rotated by an angle of pi by eight. So this is pi by eight. And uh, if if it is one, then he makes a measurement in the uh, basis set which is rotated by minus pi by eight, which is like pi by eight rotated in the opposite direction. So basically, based on so this is for y equals zero, and then this is for maybe it will be better if you can make it full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, I could have described over iPad, but yeah, I didn't keep it handy with me at that time. But uh, I hope I'm able to give some intuition. But I didn't plan it for today's session, but since there were a few minutes left and people were asking, so I thought maybe I can give some intuition for that. Hmm. Yeah. So this is what I was saying that uh, if you are basically if 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 the if input is zero, then you measure in the standard basis. This basis. If the input is one, then you measure in forty-five rotated basis. So this is Alice's strategy. Okay. Mm, so let me actually change this particular color. Yeah. So basically, for x equals one, I'm using this rotated basis, the blue basis. For x equals to zero, it's the red basis. And uh, for Bob, for y equals to zero, I have this black basis. And uh, for y equals to uh, for y equals zero, I'm putting this blue basis. For y equals one, it's this black perpendicular basis. So you, you measure basically along different different rotated bases uh, based on your inputs. And this is essentially overall the two qubits are describing the EPR pair, the ket EPR state I talked about earlier. Yeah, so I I didn't plan it for today's session. It's just that since question came up and there was some time, so I thought let me just anyways discuss. Yeah, otherwise if I would have planned, I would have created a slide on this, but I I didn't know we'll be able to get the time at end. Ah, uh, what is so special about uh, angle pi by eight? So essentially, yeah, so the calculation and all still I'm unable to do in the interest of time and. You know the uh, mm, the background and all, but uh, yeah. So you can look at on uh, that particular link I have shared. I I'll be sharing these slides. I can I can ask the I can ask people to you know share it with all of you. Uh, yeah, or I can share it inside the chat. Uh, does this allow attaching documents? I think I share your YouTube uh, course link here. That'll be useful. Ha. Huh. Later I uh, share the PDF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so YouTube link I'll share. So I have shared a link to this YouTube course, uh, so you can uh, watch the first few videos where I'll describe this particular game in detail. That will require some more mathematical formalism uh, for proofs and all. And there are other good references you'll also definitely find for CHSH game. Mm, if you are interested in a more programming sort of interface, then maybe you can also look at Cascade uh, textbook. So that's by IBM. You can look at text uh, the tutorials on Kiske textbook, mm, and there would be other good tutorials also you'll find. So yeah, so I think that's it for today. Uh, if there are further questions, let me know.
so i am a fifth semester computer science student and uh, before also i took the course of quant- uh, quantum computing through N- nptel and uh, means i like understand everything means what they told uh, in the lecture but uh, uh, coming to new questions i am unable to means like solve them mm, what sort of new questions you mean uh, like the assignment questions or the questions that i got in, in the exams mm-hmm. okay <laughs> so i don't know unless and until i know that specific question you have uh, but uh, yeah so maybe if you want to read further there are particular good textbooks you can follow like nelson and chang or if you face issues in the mathematical part then you can like try to read more on linear algebra but unless i know that specific question which you have i don't know how i can help right now mm. and so uh, i am conti- uh, continuing my research on neurological disorders in machine learning with one of my professors so uh, my idea is to take our research to uh, uh, the quantum computing implement through quantum computing so sir i have no idea how i can do that so if you can uh, okay yeah so see there are quantum ml algorithms which are there uh so if you want to just start start playing around with them you can look at tutorials on quantum svm and variational quantum classifiers if it's more of a classification sort of task uh you can just start with that and then you know see how your problem and all is formulated yeah, it will depend on so there will be some limitations also which you will see in the current hardware in terms of number of qubits which are available through to you through simulator and through the other devices there will be some noise factors also so it will be it will definitely be challenging to make it work on the currently existing quantum devices so you may not see a quantum advantage you know right away but it will always be good to start exploring and playing around uh, even with the uh, these quantum devices today we have Okay, okay thank you sir okay okay welcome ah uh, hi sir mm-hmm. yeah hi supreet uh, so uh, so um in the bell's paper in his original paper what he does is basically uh, constructs a hidden variable model himself that oh. tries to prove the quantum mechanical correlation and after he does it he successfully uh, builds a hidden variable model that actually uh, uh reproduces the quantum mechanical correlation but then realizes that this hidden variable model becomes non local <laughs> so in the end uh what he does is basically uh, uh comes up with a, a inequality and you know he assumes a local uh, a deterministic model and comes up with an inequality and he says that every local hidden variable theory that there is has to be satisfying this inequality and finally when you plug in the quantum mechanical correlations you see that the inequality is violated and that's yeah, so where you basically the inequality which is there is on operators right so in classical thing yeah. operators you have bits right so yeah so, um operators can specify uh, satisfy that inequality but not bits so yeah so then so the idea is that you know we have, that provides a proof for the quantum i mean non locality of quantum mechanics so my question is that uh so we have you know we have finally with the help of the inequality we proven that you know it's it's there's something there's some some non local phenomenon is happening but what is why are the physicists why are we still chasing for realism you know for, once we've proved that it's what is the point of realism at all you know once we've proven it's non local you know where do these uh, non local realistic theories you know uh, wh- why are we chasing realism is my question you know once we've proven the non locality that's my question mm. no, so uh, locality and realism are two different ideas and realism also has a lot to do with the philosophy part but the idea in realism is that uh, so so basically the realism what it says is that there is always a variable out there whether you know it or you not there is always some particular position some particular velocity associated with anything uh, now in quantum mechanics we say that well you do have a state associated with everything but you may not even have a sort of a physical variable which which you can access now so yeah in some sense you have realism in the sense that there's always a state vector out there but that state vector may not have you know collapsed to 
particular eigen state you want okay so in like typically in philosophy they talk about this realism versus idealism so idealism says that you know unless and until uh, you there is a conscious observer who has seen something you know then only a thing exists so for example if there is a forest and a tree has you know fallen out of there and there is a like a bang sound there is a big sound but there is nobody to hear right then basically you don't know if the tree has fallen or not so so what ideal exactly is that you know unless and until there is a specific observer the activity hasn't occurred but you know then it's a very strange sort of a thing right the universe is so large and we are in a one small part of that so how can we you know just say that only when we observe something there is something which happens so yeah yes. so those are more like philosophical debates i have been i have yeah, actually been the development of quantum mechanics has has actually always been you know either in uh, sort of it has been part of these debates always so even today yes. uh, what people discuss is that you know what exactly does it mean to measure so that is something which we don't have some clarity about right there are some theories but it's not very clear you know what's what does it exactly mean to say you make a measurement yeah yeah yes so this is something that's been bothering me actually you know it's what bell states you know what bell proves is very clear you know it it it, it basically puts an end to the question of locality or non locality per se but you know it still leaves the question of realism undecided and where does this realism actually stand you know bell theory doesn't quite talk about uh, wells inequality doesn't quite address the realism aspect of it and the fact that we're still chasing uh, uh, non local realistic theories uh, and where do these theories exactly stand and uh, what are the implication of these theories is something that i've also been thinking about actually so given that i have a physics background so i i have closely been pondering about this one question <laughs> so i i thought i might want it to all the other students question. like everyone was from physics background here or they were from cs background also the so shri uh, like what was the background of the participants i should have asked initially though cs mostly cs is it uh, so uh, we have actually distributed uh, this in the social media and in the public space so i think all sort of people are here uh, studying from professors uh, to students uh, like in students oh. level, level of physicist uh, cs btech and everything yeah i see i see i see okay <laughs> okay any other questions Yeah, although we have exceeded the time, so those who want to drop, feel free. Uh, and if somebody has questions, right, right, Dheeraj. Uh huh. So I'll also take the opportunity to ask a question, following on the footsteps of the previous question, but which is which came by. So I was just wondering, means it's a just casual ramblings sort of thing. so uh, we always describe quantum mechanical evolution as unitary evolution right and mm -hmm. measurement is a certain non unitary evolution right yeah. so probably till this day nobody doesn't know how to this dichotomy how to resolve right yeah. the projection the sudden collapse of a state vector and the normal unitary evolutional dynamics right right so right. your thoughts on that any thoughts Casual yeah answer. so actually that's what this particular problem is about this measurement problem that why why does you know measurement behave in a different way so yeah. one way to get around it is that you know if you just restrict it to your system and then there is some external environment then basically you can consider measurement process you know as being getting sort of entangled with the environment and you know then somehow if that environment is macroscopic then any macroscopic object is automatically collapsed but then you know why in that case we are trying to you know distinguish between microscopic and macroscopic sort of part, uh, objects right and what is it that gives them the difference so it's it's very unclear yeah. and uh, there are some theories on that but in fact but yeah, I, even i'm not 
like uh, like reductionism if you go by the philosophy of reduction even even macroscopic is reduced to microscopic right, there shouldn't right, be right, right, distinction right. between so there them, shouldn't right? be a sort of a dichotomy right but somehow yes, it yes. merges so yes. it, it's not very clear that what exactly happens yeah maybe you know yeah, yeah so there are some theories on decoherence and all but i'm not yeah yeah fully well versed with those uh, okay 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 yeah it's a very very nice discussion quantum mechanics is full of conundrums yeah 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 so samyadeep you are also a student or you are a faculty? yeah yeah i actually i actually did my phd in physics from iisc iisc where i uh, bang iisc bangalore right did under whom and uh, you know professor nafkan bhat uh no he is he's from the center for nano science and engineering there I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. So I worked on neuromorphic computing. Uh, so, so that's that's what my background is. So I have been interested in quantum mechanics right from my formative years, my engineering. So, I read uh, read a lot about that, both popular and non-popular. So that's why it interests me. <laughs> I see. I see, I see, I see. Okay. Uh, so we are fifteen minutes over time. Like. uh should be end here like if someone has a very specific quick question or something urgent you want to ask let me know when we we'll end for today uh slides i haven't yet shared now let me try to do that slides can share with uh, with me uh, i'll email all these people okay actually uh, uh, on chat also if people oh, want you can download from here oh nice so with you also Okay. Uh, so Chennai has a question. Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, for computer science resource from people from quantum physics background, so Nielsen and Chuang textbook has a chapter on uh, basics of uh, computer science also. So that that will be, I think, quite good for non CS people. Yeah. Okay, uh, so should we end for today? She wants a bit more advanced. Yeah, I hi. Uh, so uh, thank you for the talk. I uh, have uh, read Nielsen and Chuang, but uh, I just wanted to know if you have any, uh, you know, uh, more formal computer science related. Mm, no, but uh, what's the like? What's the topic you want to understand? So, like, there can be different resources for okay. uh, uh, both theoretical and programming related because uh, I don't really have a computer science background, but I really wanted specific to quantum to, computing. Okay, uh, specific to quantum computing, right? You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that Nelson and Chuang book will be really sufficient if you want to go into detail in some specific aspect, right? So, for example, you want to understand the programming part. and this kiske textbook is quite good but if you want to go deeper into some you know other domains of like computer science like complexity theory for example then you can find textbook on complexity theory if you want to understand cryptography part in detail then you can find textbooks on cryptography so okay. it depends you know what your goal is in which which area you want to understand deeply right uh, okay if you want to understand you know algorithm design and all then you can look at that corman lizards and rivestein book there are other good books okay also. can you give me uh, can you uh, send the name of that textbook in the chat uh, which one for algorithms that is for quantum algorithms system. that's for classical algorithms uh, okay you were asking for you know basics of uh, computer science so mm -hmm. So, but it it you don't need to like understand that book fully. So it's CLRS. If you search, you will be able to find CLRS. The call call Corman Lizards and Rivestein. So that's like one of the standard textbooks in algorithms. Okay. Yeah, it depends. You know, in programming, if there is a specific language you want to learn, specific framework, I can tell you if I know. Okay. Ah. Okay. Uh Like I mean, I've been using Python uh, like so far, and I have used MATLAB before. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. It, like so, there is actually a huge literature, right? It it depends on what your goal currently is and what you want to learn. So, Diraj, um, 
yeah so yeah. i just wanted something like i mean i've used python so maybe python if you have any you can suggest yeah it, okay so that's okay so for python i think like whatever you need to know for uh, qiskit and all you can look it into qiskit textbook but uh yeah so you can just search for like good python tutorials there would be a lot of them uh okay programming tutorials documentations sure 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 so thank Dira, you yeah hi raja yeah i just wanted to ask you what you do like you work for ibm research or uh, yeah, and yeah. what is the kind of work do you you do yeah so we work on uh, like uh, research problems so earlier i my background was in uh, computer science so earlier i used to work in machine learning problems in natural language processing recently yeah. since we have started this group in the india office at ibm research i have been working on research problems in quantum computing and uh, we also uh, like take up these sort of skilling sessions also uh, like we had today and uh, yeah so where, is, where is this based so we have two offices in gurgaon and in bangalore i am okay gurgaon office today i'm from home you can probably would have realized from the virtual background from the blurred background yeah uh, and um, and are there other people in india in ibm research working on yeah so right now we have a small team of four or five people only okay uh, some more might join us next year okay okay good thank you okay 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 sir if there are some uh, internship opportunities or a research opportunities with ibm i can yeah, have yeah so internship opportunities are there so uh, on linkedin we had posted earlier so let me share uh, let me give you this link to for internship uh hey did it uh, so i also of uh, you like we all would love to know like what was the process uh, how you uh, ended up in uh, ibm quantum research because it's very new right and what was the selection process or something of that sort no actually i had been working in ibm research for last 6 years i have been working since uh, uh, like uh, 2016 uh, so um, over there i had joined at that time through like campus interviews but uh they like most of the positions these days are off campus uh, especially for people with experience but uh, there are on campus positions or on campus sort of interviews as well for graduating students and uh, for quantum specifically it will depend on because since we have a small group we might take only one to two people so it will depend on how we take so so i had joined internally i had moved to this uh, quantum group we have here uh so uh, but yeah so we we might uh, like if at all there are opportunities you can keep looking on our page uh yeah for internship actually i am trying to search for the link but if not then maybe i'll uh, share with shri earlier if you can share with all of you later uh what kind what do you look for in people uh, like when when they are when you are recruiting when they are being recruited into ibm what is generally expected of them no it depends on which team and which sort of 
uh mean in quantum for research suppose uh like how uh, are things so we look for uh, sort of uh, your college projects which you have done any other internships you have done uh your background in quantum computing and uh, yeah so those things which we look for for specific to quantum because anyways there will be very few people already right with, who have that okay. background and all so yeah. even that and maybe you know if you have done some project or something that will also be an add on so i've shared the link uh, shared the link for the internships oh you had that okay 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 uh this is for general uh, ibm quantum yeah i was for, for this india internships i was trying to search earlier uh hi dheeraj uh, so i want to ask one more question so uh in ibm it's largely focused on quantum computing in india or you know this uh uh research group dedicated to quantum information as well uh yeah right now we have actually a very small group so yeah so i found the link to internships at ibm research india let me share uh yeah so right now we have a small group so mostly we are working on computing and machine learning based problems uh but uh, yeah so we, we right now we are not directly working in information so i have shared a link to uh, this internship program if you are interested in applying so we have sure you have to select a specific project there will be projects in several areas so there, there are three projects which we have in quantum this year and if we can work uh, officially or unofficially with uh, uh, eu engineers or uh, scientists yeah 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 so we have through these internship programs you can join or we also have uh, grm programs so internships are like paid internships with stipend grm is sort of a mentoring program wherein if you want to get mentored by someone you can join that, that over there there won't be a stipend but yeah so you work collaboratively on some research problem uh, how can we go for grm so if at all like whenever there are positions one of us you know can create a sort of a project for the candidate and, and then you can join that specific project uh so grm is again ibm wide right it's neither research specific nor quantum specific so if you go to grm page you will find lots of projects specific to quantum we can create as and when we get some idea or if a student comes up with an idea and says they want to work collaboratively we can try to uh also i think uh, one of the no uh, requirements i noticed for the internships is that we should be a part of some graduate program so what if we have already graduated like uh, in that case can we not be a part of the internship program or uh, how yeah, does that work? so it's yeah you should be a registered student at that time okay internship so maybe like if you are in you know, a planning to go for masters in future then maybe and if you have some time between the between when your bachelor's program ends or master start or between your masters and then phd start during that time also you can do an internship uh but typically it's for somebody who is a registered student okay mm. uh, hi dheeraj i just ask one last question before <laughs> this ends so uh, in ibm india you are mostly focused on the software part of quantum computing right the qiskit framework and things like that right yes yes nothing yes. related to the hardware part as of now right yeah although we also work with noise mitigation and all so some knowledge of hardware might come useful yes, there yes. but we are not yes. trying to like, uh, sort of get the hardware here right now right we are a small team and a specific sort of yeah so we don't have that uh, like group right now on on hardware in yeah. quantum hard like ibm qe is the is operating on the transmon qubits right for the quantum computing part uh, so what i read about it yeah transmon qubits or superconducting qubits superconducting qubits yeah yeah okay should we end now uh yeah sure sir thank you sir not uh, okay okay, <laughs> okay. Oh, we have thank uh, you yeah thanks yeah so someone wants to ask thank uh, you okay yeah, okay, yeah. thanks thanks dheeraj
Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. And also, uh, very good talk, Diraj. In There the short so time that we had, questions. very good talk. You know, I like the fact that you try to demonstrate the quantum game. You know, I mean uh, the game. Uh, so I would like to know how exactly uh, we get that point five. So I will check out the YouTube videos that you have sent to me, uh, sent to us, and perhaps get back to you uh, if I have any more questions. Sure, 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 sure. Okay. Okay, I hope uh, we had enough questions. Like there were so many questions and so many doubts, and it was great talk and also you no know, uh, so many insights that we got about even quantum mechanics, static quantum mechanics to internships to IPM. Like the, the talk was supposed to be novel based, but like it went over. But uh, such a beautiful talk, Tiraj. Thanks a lot for uh, your time and your expertise and your knowledge being shared here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, so we can wind up the chat then. Okay.